Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Electrical Blunders. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host. And on today's episode, we're going to look at a video that describes wiring up a branch circuit in a garage. Now, again, as you know, on this series, we're not always looking for all of the blunders. Sometimes there's good information. There's good little tidbits of knowledge to share. Sometimes we're just simply correcting terminologies, adding additional information. Um, sometimes we're giving kudos to the video itself. But at the end of the day, it's all about making sure that we clear the air for misinformation, terminologies, proper wiring techniques, and other commentary that we feel are necessary to teach you, not only the DIYer, but the electrical professional, the proper way that things should be done, at least in the scope of the minimum safety standard of the National Electrical Code. Okay, that's a lot of talking. I've got my headphones ready. Let's go on and get into the video, and let's just get at it. Again, now this video had well over... I believe a million views or something like that, 600,000 plus views. Okay, so what that means is a lot of people will watch it and learn from it. So we want to critique it and make sure that we can bring extra value to this video under commentary. So let's go on and get into it. I'll get the headphones on and we'll get started. All right, I'm ready to go. Let's go on and cue it. As you see here, it's uh, basic electrical, adding a circuit for lights in our garage. Uh, this is 30 minutes long, so I'm assuming it'll take longer than that when I add my commentary. But without further ado, let's go on and get into this episode. Good morning there, friends and neighbors. Bobby here today. Hey, folks, today we're going to do a little bit of a electrical repair. Um, actually, what we're going to do, we're going to go from this outlet right here. <clears throat> we're going to come up the wall. We're gonna uh, install a, another box and run a wire from the uh, outlet to the box. So he's got a power we'll source, he's gonna hit a switch, there. he's gonna put in some more lights. we're gonna go ahead and run a wire all the way up our wall. Pretty simple into project. Our ceiling. Now this wire will be later used for some lighting, okay? But I'm gonna show you how we get this done. Basically what we're gonna do is what we've done right over here. We've done the same thing about a year ago. We uh, ran a wire up to a box and then we ran it on up uh, through the sealing through the top plate and it operates a couple lights that we have here so folks stay tuned and we'll show you how we get this done friends the first thing we're going to do today we've got our drill here with a very large uh drill bit on it about a foot so that's an auger so. bit with a lead a bit a which is a lead end diameter. on it that'll pull it into the wood right so you shouldn't have to force above it above the box where this that one looks awful is. dull to me so somewhere so. in the center of this brace we're going to drill a hole there and we're going to go up here to the top now, drilling your plates, drilling the top plate, drilling that uh, brace, you want to make sure that you're drilling in the center of the stud, okay? Uh, the code requires that you, under 300.4, is that you have to maintain an inch and a quarter from the edge of the board hole to the edge of the framing member. And that's on both sides, not just one side facing you out into the room. It's on both sides. So that's why you want to be in the center. So you have to be very conscious of the size of bit you use because if you produce an actual dimension that's less than an inch and a quarter from the edge of the board hole to the edge of the framing member on either side of your board hole, then you're going to have to put nail plates up, okay, so that nobody can drive something through it like a sheetrock screw. Because this looks like it's unfinished, uh, but at some point it might get finished off. The whole purpose of him drilling everything is a thought that it might be finished at some point. Then you don't want to drive any gypsum board or... Maybe he puts up plywood or whatever. You don't want to drive those screws into the actual cable assembly. So we have to maintain that inch and a quarter. And that is all in 300.4 of the National Electrical Code. Okay. So just wanted to, and of course in 300.4, you'll have an A, a B, a C, and a D and your different requirements, depending on whether it's board holes, metal studs, parallel with framing members, all those rules are there. So check it out because you do have to protect those cables as it goes through board holes or parallel with framing members. All are going to be wrapped around that inch and a quarter uh, dimension. And through the double top plate, we're going to drill a hole there close to the center of the uh, two befores. So we'll show you how we get that done. Okay, let's drill through this first brace here. We're going to try to keep, stay as close to the stud as we can, but stay in the center of this brace. Now, typically, so you'll find these braces right when your walls extend more than about eight feet to ten feet. will be braces. It's just a typical eight-foot wall ceiling, uh, then you're probably not going to have these braces. The only reason I mention that is because if you're ever getting in an old house and you're trying to fish things down and you have really high ceilings, you might have braces. Just be aware of it. Alright, 
will go up top. Now for the top plate, let's go ahead and get our bit here. I see a couple nails that were driven now. We're gonna try to stay away from them. Absolutely. We're gonna tear up a blade quicker than nails. And he's looking like he's having a hard time. That bit's dull. I just my experience tells me that's a dull blade. Our bit's a little bit dull. That should have cut through there a little better, but now we've got our hole here through our brace and through our top plate. So we'll get on to the next step. Now I'll remind you that if you happen to be doing this and you, ultimately it's going to be a finished off wall with drywall on it, insulation, everything like that, that you're going to have to seal that top plate. So you have to maintain the rating of that assembly. So that hole in the top there typically is going to be filled with rock wool or, or foam or um, insulation or something in order to maintain the rating of that assembly. Okay. Uh, so again, keep that in mind uh, that you would typically would fill that hole once you run your cable through it. Uh, and so that you don't have the, uh, in, in, in the code, you want to look at 300.21, uh, the spread of products of combustion and things like that. So maintaining that plates there maintains the rating of that cavity. Anytime you drill it, you're no longer maintaining the rating of that cavity and you need to maintain it by filling that hole. Put your cables in it and then you would fill around the cables, okay? Now, in this case, you're probably thinking, well, it's all unfinished anyway. That's true. But again, thinking about the end result of what's going to happen if it potentially gets finished off, then you're going to have to maintain a rating of that assembly. Okay, friends, before we start doing any wiring here, we want to make sure we got our power off. And I want to show you this little tool I have right here. These are neat. You can pick these up at any home improvement store. And what it is, you plug it into an outlet, and it's got three different lights on it. And what's supposed to happen is these um, yellow lights are supposed to be on. It tells you right here, if the circuit's wired correctly, the two yellow lights are on. If you got a red light on and this yellow light you have a hot neutral reverse and it goes on down the chart and it tells you what the problem is if you have anything other than the two yellow lights on. So, so let me give you a little bit of insight about these. So this is a three light tester. Um, this three light tester is fine for detecting reverse polarity. That means where the neutral is supposed to be on the left on the long slot in the ungrounded hot conductor on the right with a shorter slot, they can be re reversed. That can cause a problem with some types of power tools that, that plug in. Uh, and you just want to be aware that reverse polarity can also cause problems if you plug lamps in it because there's a certain way that the lamp works with the Edison base. And if it's reverse polarity, you could be screwing it in with a, a lamp in there or people call light bulb and you're actually touching the outer perimeter of the base of the Edison base, and it's actually could shock you because it's reversed than what it's supposed to be. Okay, so things to think about. The hot's supposed to be at the point at the bottom and the actual perimeter is supposed to be the neutral, but it can get reversed depending on reverse polarity. So at any rate, this device can tell you that. The problem with these devices is they're not the smartest devices in the world. So if you had a circuit and you're doing retro remodel and you're coming in and you plug this in and it says you got the two yellow lights, everything's good, just be careful because it could be that you have a cable that has no equipment ground. Maybe it's older wiring. Uh, and then what happens is, but the light tests out fine because they put a three-prong plug in there and a, a three-prong receptacle device in there. And what happens is it says that it's okay, but it's really not because of something called a bootleg ground. Because the equipment grounds and the neutrals in a normal brand circuit go back to the same location in the main panel, you can take that neutral and wrap it around the equipment ground terminal on a receptacle and it'll make this tester look like it's okay. But that's called a bootleg ground because you don't want that to happen. Okay, you don't want the equipment ground and conductor terminal to be connected with the grounded neutral conductor and it's a violation of 250.24A5 of the NEC downstream. You don't want that to take place. You want separation. So it's a bootleg grounds can fool this tester. And that is when somebody takes a neutral and connects it over to the equipment ground on the receptacle because no equipment ground is present in this box. And they wanted to put in a, a three prong receptacle device in order to fool, let's say a home inspector on a flip project. So just be aware of that. These aren't perfect foolproof devices right here, but they can find open neutrals. They can find missing grounds. They, they can find reverse polarity, all those type of things. 
very good for that application. So let's plug it in and we can see that both our yellow lights are on, red lights off. So this thing's wired correctly. Now we're gonna go on over here to the breaker box and we're gonna flip the breaker and I already know which one it is. I will also remind you that since this is in a garage, it needs to be on a GFCI circuit and that's in accordance with 210.8. So um, I'm assuming back at the panel, he's protecting with a GFCI. So just keep that in mind, receptacles in a garage, GFCI protection requirement under 210.8A of the National Electrical Code. So again, you've got a, a 210.8A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You have different conditions, different locations. Garages would be a location that requires GFCI protection. And when I come back, I'll know that there's no power on this circuit before I start messing with it. So just always remember safety first. And this here is a no-brainer. I mean, you got it plugged in there, the light goes off, you know there's no power. They also had the testers like this that had the GFCI trip function and as a testing device. You put it in, it will test it. Basically, it shunts it to the equipment ground and it will trip off the GFCI device upstream. Um, this one's just a plain old tester. I see it's a plain old, and I should also clear up while I'm here. That plastic box is an outlet box or a device box. That receptacle is not an outlet. That is a device, a receptacle device that's placed in an outlet box, okay? we People refer to it, and I'll do it as well from time to time, is that is not a plug, that is not an outlet, that is a device, okay? But, you know, we're, we're so prone to calling it an outlet, but the outlet is actually the box itself, okay? Whether or not I put a receptacle device in it or I hardwired from that box to a piece of equipment, that is still an outlet box, okay? Uh, so again, just terminologies, that's a device that's in there that he's plugging that into, not an outlet, theoretically, okay? Well, physically, theoretically, physically, whatever. You get what I mean. Now, friends, what we've done, we went ahead and took a measurement uh, earlier and made us a mark here at 38 inches from the top of our shoe plate because that was about the uh, same distance that it was on the rest of the light switches and we just kind of want them all to look uniform. So we've got a new box here, okay? Now we're going to nail it onto the wall this way and we've got to run a wire up through the bottom and we've got to run a wire out through the top. So I'm going to go ahead and break out. I'm going to take just this little body hammer I have here. And these little fiberglass ones, they just break out real easy. Just go ahead and knock a hole right there in the box for the wire to come come in and out of there, okay? And do the same thing on the bottom side. So we're going one in, one out. It actually gives you a place to do two two wires in and out if you wanted to. But we're just going one in, one out. So Cables, not wires. About. Again, all have to run cables. Can't run now individual wires, right? That these boxes have a little lip that sticks out here. And that lip is approximately a half inch. And what that allows you to do is to have your box sticking out at least a half inch uh, to make up for your sheetrock or your plywood or whatever you're going to put down. So we're going to stick it up against the stud, bottom of it. That's where I made my mark. That was at the bottom of the box. Now remember, many people put the mark, for example, when I do my receptacles around a room, I do them at 16 inches. There's 16 inches to the top of the box. When I do my switch locations, I typically use 50 inches to the top. Um, when I do my countertops, I usually do 50 inches to the top, keep it consistent. Um, uh, but you can do it to the top, to the bottom, or to the middle, however you want, but be consistent. In this case, it really doesn't matter because you're putting up something in the garage. But again, just a tip, be consistent so that everything's the same. Last thing you want in a room is have these different heights and things like that. And we'll go ahead and just uh, nail, it in, nail it in place. We'll get it started. Both of them started. Okay. Okay, friends, we're ready for the next step. Now we'll go ahead and start taking our. Uh, outlet out here. So first thing we want to do is go ahead and pull our cover off and we'll lay that aside. And it looks like it's going to be a straight blade. So let's go ahead and pull our, our outlet out of the box. Put a 
Let's do that right quick. Again, it's a receptacle device, not an I'll outlet. The time. I'll just it's okay. It we all know what he's saying. We all get it. I get it out. Not here to critique those things okay, that friends, are common we got slang. The, uh, outlet it's okay. pulled out of here. Okay. Uh, this is all run and uh, looks like number twelve wire. Um, and what they did here, they went ahead. I'm gonna leave this in place because they've skint the wires back and pushed them into the little push-in part to make a connection. I'll show you here in just a minute what I'm talking about. Because on an outlet. Uh, you have here's an outlet right here and you see the screws on the side you can either make your attachments you know you can skin your wire back and wrap them around to make your connection or you can simply skin them back and push them in it's like a little uh, quick connect I mean it goes in but it won't come out and that's the way this was done so I'm gonna leave it in place like that and I'll make my connection from a new wire on these screws on the side now let's now, let me make a quick observation real quick. Do you notice the slot pattern that's on the front of this device? It's a 15-amp device. Now, he's putting it on a 20-amp circuit. So many people ask, it's a 12-gauge coming in, but that's a 15-amp rated device. If you go to your National Electrical Code, uh, you'll notice that in table 210.21B3, again, 210.21B3, for a 20-amp branch circuit, you're allowed to use a 15 or 20-amp rated receptacle. So this is why in kitchens, many times it's a 20 amp circuit running to the countertop. You'll notice that they're 15 amp rated receptacles because the code allows me to do that. Now, if it had been a 15 amp rated circuit that he's running here, then the receptacle could not be rated greater than 15 amperes. But since it's a 20 amp circuit, you are permitted to use a 15 or 20 amp rated receptacle. So by looking at the faceplate on this, I noticed that. Now, the other thing that I'll bring up is I really can't tell the other receptacle. It looks the same way, but he's they're backwiring a 12 gauge into a 15 amp rated receptacle. Typically, that's a no-no. Um, it shouldn't be allowed for you to jam in 12 gauge into the back of a 15 amp rated receptacle. Okay, uh, you would have to go to the terminal lugs on the side of it again. So again, check your listing of your your device that you're working with. Uh, but typically, if it's a 15 amp rated receptacle then you would, if you were going to backwire it, then it would generally be 14 gauge. Um, if not, you're going to go to the terminal screws. Okay, so typically that, you know, again, look at your device, make sure you do your due diligence ahead of time, but that's typically what we see. But again, I wanted to clarify for those out there that, yes, it is okay to have a 20 amp brand circuit, that's 12 gauge NMB, and using 15 amp rated devices, perfectly fine. Where you get that is in 210.21B3 and subsequent table tells you that that's perfectly okay to do so. So just kind of things I want to throw out in there. Let's talk about that a minute. If you look at an outlet, okay? Receptor, see. device. See if you can see what I'm doing here, okay? And if you can look at the outlet in your house or whatever, you'll, you'll always notice that one side's a little bit bigger. It's longer, okay? Now that is the neutral wire. That is the white wire. The, the side that is a little bit shorter. Could be gray as well. Wire. Okay. okay, and that's the black wire. Two hundred dot six. Of course, the round will tell you one whether or not you use white or gray, wire. or any and color other than green, with three white or gray stripes. Wire. Okay. okay, so let's go over here to the uh, outlet, and we can see that our black wire is hooked up to the side that has the okay. little shorter. That is a fifteen um, amp rated slot. device. You can tell because the neutral side would have a little T slot to the side with the longer one. And then the ground wire grounds to the switch here on the bottom. I'll show you on this one. Uh, right here where the green screw is, that's where the ground wire hooks up, okay? Now... Okay, I hear a lot of terminologies, and this is okay. When people say ground wire, you don't have that defined in the National Electrical Code. That is basically an equipment grounding conductor. Uh, we refer to that sometimes as the safety conductor because when you hear people talk about branch circuit, the circuit conductors are the black and the white. The equipment ground is not part of the circuit conductors. It is part of the safety component that allows an overcurrent device like that breaker to trip on a ground fault. So at the end of the day, it's called an equipment grounding conductor, an EGC, not a ground wire. We know what he's saying, so we're all good with that. Again, layman's terms. Again, people can understand it. Um, but again, now the other thing I want to point out is you'll notice in that box, uh, there's a lot of sheeting in there. Now, the code requires that you carry in at least a quarter of an inch. Can you have more sheathing than a quarter of an inch in a box? Yes, you can. Code doesn't say 
the, the, it says the minimums, but it doesn't say the maximums. So again, for those that wonder about that, um, many people will say it doesn't look very professional. It doesn't look neat, but it works and it's not a violation of the NEC. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, what we're going to do, since they've already used the push ins, we're going to hook our wire up to the screw heads. So we, we will, if we're looking at this, we've got our longer slot here. We can hook our white wire up to either one of these posts will work, either one of them. And over here, we'll hook our black wire up to either one of these posts here. I'll also say that this is obviously a, a, a quite a few years old of a video. So um, typically the 12 gauge NMB that you would see, like what you have running back there under his arm, uh, back into the wall, typically that would be orange, uh, excuse me, that would be yellow sheathing for 12 gauge. Not a requirement by the code, but it's a kind of a system that was started by Uncoil Wire Corporation many years ago. Um, and basically everybody's pretty much copied it now. At a glance, it would tell you the size of the conductors inside of the cable assembly. So in this case, it's white. So again, there was a time when 14, 12, and 10 all had white sheathing. Uh, but now what you're probably going to run into is for it to be 12 gauge, you'll see a yellow sheathing. 14 gauge conductors inside of it will be a white sheathing. Uh, and 10 gauge would be an orange sheathing. And anything larger like a 6 or 8 are going to be black sheathing. Okay, just kind of a visualization of what you would see today in some of your newer installations. And then we can make a connection to the ground wire or we can um, back this one off and tie them together. Uh, I'll show you that when we actually get to that point. But that's the way that we'll hook our wires up and we'll run them up here to our box. So let's go ahead. I've got some number 12 wire here. A whole roll of it. A 50 foot there you roll. go. See the see the, uh, and we'll the just actual yellow? Hold up. I'm going to cut off a little, a little bit more than I think we're going to so It tells me that other wiring has been there a while. So we'll make sure we have enough. Before they became a standard. Use our now when we say standard, not written here, anywhere, it's become we'll an industry standard we'll to use the that. colored sheathing. And we'll go ahead and run it. I've already punched out a spot on the back of this box here. So we'll go ahead and run it into here. And then we'll, we got our other box up here. And we'll go ahead and run our, let's see if we can move the camera so you can see what I'm doing. And let me give you a little advice here. I would not run the sheeting in because what this does is, if my years of, of doing arc testing and testing circuits, what happens is that people will go in here and try to strip off the sheathing once it's already in the box. Now, obviously people do it that way. The problem that you run into that is you're trying to go in there with a, with a utility knife or something and trying to cut it, that a lot of times you put little cut marks in the insulation. And based on the proximity to the equipment ground, you can have arcing that can take place. Now, granted, takes quite a bit of current for this to take place uh, because of passion's law and the ability for that arc to jump over from the insulated conductor over to the actual equipment ground. But it is plausible that it could happen and we just don't want any damage to the insulation. So I find it much easier to take that first piece that he's doing here, strip off the amount you need, at least six inches free conductor, 300.14 of the NEC. You've got to have at least six inches of free conductor, especially in a box like this. And what we want to do is put that in the box and then staple it and secure it between boxes and then measure it off and then strip and cut and cut the remainder off and, and speed it into the box with the ends already stripped off rather than pushing it into the box. And then you have to get in there with a knife. And that is probably why that box on the bottom has so much sheathing in it because that's what they did. Okay. I'm just giving you tips on how I would do it. Pre-strip off that sheathing before you even put it in the box. It's just make your life a little bit easier. There we go. And we'll go ahead and put a little curve in it. And we'll run our wire through here. It doesn't mean what he's doing is wrong, folks. Okay. It just means so a little bit easier way to do it. Run from our old box up to our light switch box, okay? Now we'll uh, use a staple and we'll actually make it, uh, we'll actually staple this to the, uh, to the wire. I'll show you that in a little bit. I've actually got to run up to the uh, hardware store and pick up some because I don't. So stapling, okay? Now, see those single gang nail up boxes, the blue one at the bottom? And of course, he's using a fiber gray at the, at the top. You need to secure that cable within eight inches, okay? Eight inches of the opening that it enters into the box. Um, now, if that was a box with a built in clamp on it, or you added a clamp on it, then you could go up to 12 inches. But because of the size of this box, which is a four by two and a quarter, I believe, uh, or two and an eighth, um, then at this point, 
you're going to have to have a staple within eight inches. Now, it could be one staple in the middle gets to within eight inches of both of them, okay? But you need to keep that in mind. It has to be secured and supported within eight inches. In this case, more, more or less, it's the securing, but it does supporting as well to the stud. Now, you also want to make sure that you're stapling in the middle of the stud. Again, you cannot be less than an inch and a quarter from the edge of that frame member over to the sheathing edge of that cable assembly. Because if you're less than that, then you're going to have to put nail plates up uh, and that's going to be a problem and you don't want to get involved in that. And you got plenty of stud there. Keep it in the center and you don't have anything to worry about. And do not drive the staple till it drives into the sheathing. If you drive in and it indents into the sheathing at all, then that's too tight. It doesn't have to be that tight. It's not like it's going to walk away. Okay. You just need to put the staple in enough to keep it in place, to keep it in the center of the stud. That's what you're trying to do with it. Don't want to drive it home. I see many people overdrive staples. Unnecessary. I don't know exactly where mine are right now. So we'll do that and then we'll run our other wire and we'll get all this pre-wired and we'll start hooking everything up. Okay, friends, we went ahead and ran our uh, wire <clears throat> that goes up through the top plate. What we did, we went ahead and ran it up. We got it stretched across here um, and we nailed a box. Uh, right up there to where I can either get to it through the ceiling here or if I eventually uh, <coughs> Cover the ceiling with OSB I can get through it get to it from the attic to make a connection for my wiring uh, For my lights or if I need to work on something So we got a junction box up there that we can easily get to from the Now remember he's gonna have to secure that cable within eight inches of that box so hopefully on that uh, ceiling rafter he's going to do that and coming up the wall the same scenario now nmb non-metallic sheet cable you're going to secure and support it every four and a half feet that's in accordance with 334.30 of the national electrical code so if you need to go look that up that's 334.30 of the national electrical code and it's going to tell you that you secure it and support it every 12 inches from a box that's with a clamp again if it's does not have a clamp like a single nail up box like what we see in this picture then you have to do it within eight inches of that okay now once you get down to uh going down the wall then you want to secure it every four and a half feet and remember as it runs through board holes that is considered securing okay so again meets that requirement but just want to remind you he's going to have to do all this securing and supporting all this cable the attic or from down here until we get to that point now what we're going to do, we're going to run up to the hardware store, get some of the little U-shaped nails to uh, attach all our wire down nice and snug. And then we'll cut off any excess up there. We'll roll it up, tuck it into the uh, junction box, and then we'll come down here and start making our connections. So we'll see in just a little bit. One more thing I will remind you that if you go look in the National Electrical Code, Go look at 334.30 under securing and supporting. And you'll notice that there's allowance for horizontal runs through holes and notches. So that's when you run horizontal. What it says in the code, and I will read it to you because it's important here based on the what you see on the screen. It says, in other than vertical runs, okay, other than vertical, it says cables installed in accordance with 300.4 shall be considered to be supported and secured where such supports does not exceed four and a half feet intervals and the non-metallic sheathing cable is securely fastened in place by an approved means within 12 inches of each box, cabinet, conduit body, uh, body, and, and other non-metallic sheath cable terminations. Okay, so horizontally running through frame room members considered secured and supported. Running vertically, you still have to meet the requirements of securing and supporting. Within 12 inches, unless it's a nail-up box like this, then it's going to have to be done within 8 inches. Okay. And if you're asking where that reference is to the eight inches, because you're in here looking at 334.30, you say, Paul, what are you talking about? So I want you to go to 334. I mean, 314, excuse me, I'm jumping all over the place. And if you go to 314, then you're going to say, okay, where am I going to meet these rules? Why does it have to be secured within a certain distance? And what I want to take you to is if you look here um, and you'll see an allowance under 314.17B, and you'll see this exception under B2, and it says, uh, where non-metallic sheet cable is used with a single gang non-metallic box, not larger than a nominal two and a quarter by four and a half, I said that earlier, uh, mounting in walls or ceilings, 
and where the cable is fastened within eight inches of the box measured along the sheathing. Okay, so general rule is that all cables have to be secured to a box. This is allowing you not to have to secure it to the box because again, he just knocked out a hole, but I would have to secure it within eight inches. Whereas the rule over here in 334.30 is saying that I need to secure it within 12 inches of the box. It assumes you're gonna have a clamp actually on the box. Okay, so that's kind of how you work back and forth through the NEC. So be aware of 314.17B, uh, two exception, and then, of course, all the general rules in 334.30. So a lot of stuff to learn here. But when you're running vertical like he's doing, there is no allowance for that to be secured through that board hole. It has to meet the securing supporting requirements that are written in the code. Okay, friends. Hey, we're back here now. And we've got these little clips here that we're going to use. Oh, I hate to, those. Um, <clears throat> secure the wire to the stud. And all you do is stick it around the wire and uh, drive in a little good nail. news is you can't now, drive the staple too far the with those so that's a good thing for diy like wires. In the center of the stud and uh we want to go all the way around and secure the wire so we'll just start right here uh in between these two boxes again within eight and inches we'll because of the type of box it is remember 314.17b because you're not clamping we'll that cable to in. the box so that's how we get there try not to hit the wire and smash the wire just try to hit just the nails and we're good to go right there and that holds the wire secure now what we're going to do is go ahead and work all the way around and we'll get all these secure so down, he'll go to the next we'll four and a half to, feet uh, and then put another the next one. step where we start hooking everything up in the boxes all right so so far okay not big problem anything so again not too big of a deal right now so far okay friends we've got our wire secured to our stud all the way around now this is my first concern is see how he's running it up through that brace that would not meet the requirement for securing and supporting because that's not a horizontally run cable that's vertical so he would still have to have it secured within eight inches of that box and so for craps and giggles we'll assume that above that brace he has one in and it's within eight inches of that box okay but running it through that board hole there again if you go back and look at the requirements in the code and 334.30, you'll notice that it talks about horizontal runs through holes and notches. It's not talking about vertical runs, okay? You might say, what's the big deal? I'm just saying. That's what the code says. It's looking pretty good. Um, we're back here at the box now. So we want to go ahead and start uh, making these connections. I'm going to take this razor blade knife here, and I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go about to the, about where my thumb is. I'm going to leave like a few inches of the, Full insulation. Uh, okay, so that's not insulation, that is sheathing. And there's no rule that says that you can't leave a couple inches in there. But you have to have at least a quarter of an inch enter into the box. Uh, in the same way with the clamp, you'd have to have a quarter of an inch extend beyond the clamp. But as it enters the box. Probably excessive, but not a violation. A little harder to work with the wire, putting the wire, pushing the wires back in, or pushing the cable assembly back in. A little more trouble but not a violation. Now, what is a problem is I just don't like people going in the boxes with razor knives because you don't want to nick the insulation, which is actually on the conductors. What he's cutting now is the sheathing. Okay. It's not insulation. It has no insulating value at all. Uh, inside the box, I don't want it to pull out. I don't want to cut it too far back, but we want to go ahead and just, trick, just cut your slip just through the outside part of it. And then you can pull that back and trim that off. And what that does, that exposes all three of your wires. And you got a little piece of cardboard here, you can, like paper, you can cut that. Paper, so that uh, means that um, I know that this install is in the US and under ANSI <coughs> standard UL719. Because no of the paper wrap. In Canada, you wouldn't have that way. paper. Do the same thing with the other one. Go ahead and just cut a slit down it. Now, uh, one thing I will mention, and this is important for all the people watching if you're doing this. You need to have at least six inches of free conductor under 300.14 of the National Electrical Code. Remember, check it out, 300.14. I need to have at least six inches of conductor from the point it enters into the box out for me to be able to apply and put my devices on, okay? Now, if in any dimension it is less than eight inches in any dimension, then I also have to make sure that I have at least three inches 
that extend beyond the edge of the box. Now, let's go look at that. Take your time. Uh, you can obviously pause it and go to look at 300.14. And here's what it says about free conductor. Okay. It says at least six inches of free conductor measured from the point that it, from the point in the box where it emerges from the raceway or cable sheathing uh, shall be left at each outlet. Now, interesting here, it says the point where it emerges. Well, his doesn't emerge like three inches into the box. Okay. So, you know, so again, you got to have at least six inches of free conductor as it emerges into the box. Okay. As it leaves the cable sheathing. So that bottom one, he might have a problem with depending on where he strips it from. Um, now, if you're doing things, like I said earlier, if you're doing uh, raceways and things like that, it's really going to be from the moment that emerges from the raceway to the point it comes in. And typically, when we're only going to put a quarter of an inch of sheathing into the box from this cable, you, you're about, it's about at the point it enters, about a quarter of an inch. So that's where you would she uh, rip off the sheathing. So you want to have six inches of conductors. So his, he's coming in with sheathing a little more than a quarter of an inch, maybe three inches or so. So he'd have to measure his six inches from the point where it emerges from the sheathing, and he has to maintain that. Yes, there'll be more in there because of the cable, but because of what it says, it says it emerges from the actual sheathing. That bottom one might be a little less than six inches. Anyway, it also goes on to say where the opening to an outlet, junction, or switch point is less than eight inches in any direction. So that's measuring across the surface of the box. In this case, this was a four by two and a quarter you don't have any dimension that's going to be more than eight inches. So if that's the case, it says that each conductor shall be long enough to extend three inches outside of the opening. So that means from the front of the box that it has to be able to extend three inches. Now with this box, if you give yourself six inches from the point it emerges from the sheathing, then you're probably not going to have a problem with having at least three inches outside the box. But again, you have to have at least six inches. And if the dimension in any dimension is less than eight inches in any dimension, across the surface of that box opening, then I have to also make sure it extends out three inches beyond the front of the box or the opening of the box, okay? Again, usually with boxes like this, that's not gonna be a big deal if you've got six inches from, the, from when it emerges from it, okay? All right, so just kind of extra things. Now also mention, do not cut your equipment grounds off short. They need to also meet this rule of at least six inches and extend three inches past the edge of the box if the box dimensions in any way are less than eight inches, okay? Seriously, that equipment ground needs to be long. I see too many people twist them together and cut it off really short. They need to be adequate. That doesn't even matter if you put a pigtail on it. You need to have your initial conductors at least six inches from the point it emerges uh, from the raceway or in this case, from the cable assembly, okay? Give yourself enough room to make those terminations. And then you can pull back as far as you can, still leaving some of the insulation inside the box. Don't want to pull out of the box. So now we've got <clears throat> those wires exposed and we'll trim off our piece of paper. And let's see, let's go down here on the bottom and we'll go ahead and do this one too. On this side, we'll pull it, we'll cut a slit in it. Pull back our insulation. That's actually sheathing. It's not insulation. It off. The insulation is around the conductor itself. Sheathing is a protective away. membrane. And we're ready for the next step. Those conductors look awful short. Okay, friends, let's start with making our connection down here at the box. Let's All right, look a little wire. better when we he pulls it down. Okay. Wire sticking out. We'll give him the benefit we don't of the want doubt. To leave too little. We won't have plenty to work with. But I'm yeah, I know those ones on the right. About two is so not uh, out of the box. six inches from we'll the point where it, the it leaves wire. the sheathing. We'll the <laughs> but that's wire. existing, okay. right? I'm sure he had and then inspections. We'll, uh, we'll take our wire strippers here, and we'll skin back about an inch on there. Okay. An inch. An inch wow. or so, maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch, and we'll go ahead and. Get that off of there <clears throat> on both of these wires. All right, we got that skimp back. Now on the copper wire, we're gonna leave it a little long here for a minute because I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and disconnect this ground wire here at the bottom. On this Equipment solid. grounding conductor for those that yeah, are terminology like driven. Hang on just a minute. 
Okay, now I got the right screwdriver. Let's go ahead and disconnect this. And just back it out a little bit. Pull the wire off of here. If we can, we might need our pair of uh, needle nose pliers to do so. Go ahead and pull this wire out, out of here. Some tough old wire. It's 12 gauge. Now, let's 12 gauge. 12 gauge is tough, um, buddy. We're going to cut this off clean. Don't this cut any off of that. On the end of it. It's already short we'll enough. Cut it off. All right, now. No! We've got to tie these two wires together and make short. our connection back here. Uh, Let me show you what we're going to do. Too that. short, guys. We're going to take our big pliers here. Trust me. Give yourself enough wire to work with. Do, do the next person that comes along a favor and not have to deal with those little teeny pieces. Okay, there was plenty of wire there. It was perfectly fine. Straighten it out. Splice it with the other one. Put a jumper over, uh, a, a equipment bonding jumper over two. Just, again, don't cut it off. It's already short enough. You heard what I said about the length in 300.14. It was already too short. But here we go. <clears throat> now you just got this we'll little space you got to work in. It's just awkward. Bit. And we're going to uh, grab the... And look how the bundle is so... Wires. It's just not going to go back in the and wall as easy now. And just start twisting. We're going to twist clockwise. Well, hang on. I guess we've got a little bit of different diameter wire. That might be number 10 wire this thing is wired with. But anyway, let's just start back here. We're just going to twist these two wires together. I doubt it's 10. Let's get started. And then we'll take our pliers. We'll grab hold to the end here. <clears throat> and let's just go ahead and twist it. Don't twist too much to where you actually break Notice the how the bundle is so wire. clumped up. It's it's, not, you don't uh, want that. Okay. It will break if you twist it too much. We'll go ahead and get that uh, twisted together where it makes good connection. And then... We've got these little copper pieces here, okay? These little pieces right here, it's just like a little piece of copper, and it's got a hole, a large hole in the middle of it. And let's slide these on here. And we'll slide maybe two on there if we can. Don't need but one if and you do it then, right. we've got those slid over top of that, and we'll take our pliers. And we'll actually crimp, crimp these pieces. Okay. And that you actually want to use a crimper for this, not just take your normal side cutters and just crush them, right? You want to use a crimper for this. Uh, let me give you a quick observation, though. Too short, even his pigtail is short. Um, this is why it's important, folks. If you're wiring it, and you're doing all these circuit conductors a certain length, and again, circuit being the black and the white, those are circuit conductors. The equipment grounding conductor is so vital to the safe operation of the electrical system that, again, make sure you have the same amount of conductor for that as you do with any of the other conductors. Um, it's also so much easier to train it back in the box if it's not so short. So there is a reason why you have a certain length. Of course, the code 300.14, length of free conductor, again, that doesn't just apply to the blacks and the whites and the hots and things like that, the grounded conductor. It also applies to the equipment grounded conductor. These are just way too short. Uh, and again, is it gonna work? Yes. But if you're doing your work, I'm gonna save you the grief of trying to get in the box and all these problems. Um, just leave yourself enough conductor to be able to do the work. Follow the requirements of 300.14. Uh, do it right the first time. That helps to ensure that we have a good <clears throat> connection there between these two wires, okay? And I also have a little clipping tool here that you can go back and see <clears throat> how the ends are made. This is actually for automotive use. Now that's automotive, so that's uh, but there is a crimping tool that you can get and to make that crimp. A little extra. But right uh, at least he's crimping it, okay? Give him but that, that much. helps to uh, crimp, the, crimp those wires together. So we got a good connection there. And now we can go ahead and wrap this back around. Oh my God! Don't our, don't uh, don't do it that close to the crimp down here at the bottom for our ground. Okay, I think <sighs> we'll go ahead and just wrap it, and then we'll snip it off. <sighs> right, so we've got it wrapped on there. Look how tight that bundle. Look, it just is it going to work? Yes. Is this the way you want to do it? No. 
Okay, you had enough conductor on the end anyway, put you a hook in the end of it, put that on it. It allows you to train everything back in the box a little easier. Right now you've got this big clump of short wires. It's just, okay, there is a reason. Now, some people think longer is worse to get in a box. It's not. It allows you to accordion the wires into the box a little bit better. Uh, again, is it gonna work? Yes, but he wrapped it around and he's gonna cut off the copper he should have put a loop in the end of it, okay? Now, again, you can say, well, Paul, we don't have to. I get it. But right now, those equipment grounds are just really short and uh, just not the way that we would do it professionally. Okay, so it's not just a DIY. I'm giving you commentary on what I would do, but give yourself enough wire. And again, these are just really short conductors everywhere. <clears throat> Let's pull it a little tight here with the, with the needle nose. So ultimately, from the point where it emerges from the sheathing, okay, his equipment grounds aren't good. but about three inches long. That would be a violation of 300.14 of the NEC. Okay. Now let's okay. tighten it down and we'll snip it up. Now you're saying, Paul, what does it care? It's a DIYer. Well, if something happened to happen and burn down and somebody like an expert came in there and I found this, I can only imagine what else is being done okay. here. Okay. So again, do it right. Brown. Follow the code. Minimum nice standard. Tight. Both Don't have wires a are crimped together. And we'll cut off our excess here. We don't need that. And we'll move on to hooking up the uh, black and white wire. You just make it a lot harder to work with now. Okay, it's all stubby. Now we're that's, why, wire, that's why he's white wire probably going to cut away the, in a minute. The slot just saying. The larger one. Take you a pair of needle nose pliers and just go ahead and uh, grab it at the very end and kind of shape it into a J shape. Okay and hook it around your uh, screw here that we've already backed out. We've already backed this screw out. Notice how he's got Let's no go room to work on anything. I'm just giving you advice. He's really cramped up in here trying to force things in. Give yourself enough wire, folks. Too cramped. Mm. And if you follow this approach and you're doing multi-gang boxes, you're going to have a nightmare trying to get everything back in that box. Just grab it and hook it around there if we can okay now if you need to crimp it anymore grab your needle nose pliers pull it around there around that screw head as tight as you can and then we can go ahead and tighten up the white wire now okay. remember you probably don't do this but all remember, of those terminations are required to be torqued i know you don't but 110.14d requires you that you actually, every termination in a building has a torquing requirement. I know, I know, probably don't want to hear it. But, but again, most of the time I use a torquing screwdriver and you can get cheap ones from Husky that typically will be from eight to 40 uh, inch pounds. Um, and so that's typically what you'd use on these size screws. When you get up to big things like wrenches and you'll have foot pounds, um, but again, the manufacturers do have a torquing requirement for these terminations, uh, but typically I find that eight uh, inch pounds is probably fine, but at least you're torquing it to something rather than just tighten it, tighten it, tighten it tight as you can. You run the risk of stripping out the threads and then it makes a loose connection and you create what's called a series arc. Just be careful, use the proper tools. If you're just gonna tighten it down, tighten it down so it makes really good contact. You don't have to over tighten it again, but I recommend you following the requirements in 110.14D and torquing it properly to the manufacturer's specifications. It down in a clockwise position. So wrap the wire around there in a clockwise position to where it's always pulling it in there. It's not trying to spit it out. So we've got that nice and tight. Let's flip it around this way. And uh, we're gonna take our needle nose on this side and do the same thing. We'll grab it right at the tip. See how he's just kind of working such a little space? And we'll spin it around. Like so. And hook up the black wire. It's cramped. Remember the Doesn't black need to be cramped. That's why we wire. give you enough wire. Okay? That's why we have to extend out and give you six inches to be able to do this. Yeah, we'll see if we can do this. Next and we have to make sure that in this size box that it extends at least three inches beyond the face of the box. A bit more difficult. He doesn't have either of that. Okay. Just makes it more difficult. Okay, we got a crimp around there. 
Let's go ahead and tighten it up. And I hate to be in critical for him because he is a DIYer doing it himself. Okay. He's trying to help people. I get it. And that's not why I'm here. Action, folks. Now remember <clears throat> our old wire that come down through here. It was uh, pushed in, you know, to the back of the outlet. And what we done, we made a connection to our new wire. We tied our, tied our ground wire together and we hooked our black wire on the positive side and our neutral wire on the other side. So now we're ready to sh Now I will give you this other advice. Now see that stud in the back? He said it was old wiring, but it looks to me like that board hole is less than an inch and a quarter from the surface. Nail plate. Best friend can be a nail plate if you ever go to finish it. And he made a comment earlier in the video that he might finish it out. So again, it's a good time to resolve that. The other thing is, I know that that is a 15 amp rated receptacle, and he said that's either 12, and he even made a comment it might be 10. I doubt it. Should not backstab it for that. I believe with that, that device that it's designed for 15 amp, that it's going to be limited to a 14 gauge, but somebody jammed the 12 in the back. That means it could put undue uh, stress on the contact points in that device. Probably not something that I would do. I would probably, here's what I would have done. I would have not put that device, I would have pulled the device completely apart. Uh, I would have pigtailed uh, leads on it with a white and black, take the two blacks together, two whites together. They're short. They're already short because they were there. And, and I would have given myself a longer pigtail so that I could safely make everything up outside of the box. And then it would have all folded back in neatly. Okay. So again, he chose to not remove the device. But again, I believe that that 12 going into the back of that 15 amp device, which is rated for 15 amp years because of the faceplate design, probably not designed to receive 12 gauge in the back. Okay. So um, could be wrong, but I don't believe so. So anyway, I would have redone that. Uh, save yourself some problems down the road, possibly. Shove all this back into the box, if we can. He's having a heck of a time because everything is so short. Is now, this is because it's too short. Now, but you just that's an example of the benefit of longer. The benefit of longer conductors is that you can accordion them and get them back in there okay. When they're short, it's hard to bend it. Plus, he's got that big splice right there. It's just so much hard. You don't have it much to work with. Plus, he left the sheathing on it. It's just you're trying to force it. And when doing so, you do a couple things. For one, if that receptacle is backwired with that 12 and it's not rated for that, then there's a chance that what happens is he could be putting extra undue stress on those contact points. It could be damaging it inside. I'm not saying it is, but it could. It could be loosening his terminations because he didn't torque it. Uh, all those type of things, it could be uh, working loose. So again, he's having to force it in there because the leads were just too short. Keep working with it and folding it and you'll get it pushed back in there to where you can get your screws back in place. Okay, friends, well, we've got it back in there. We're gonna screw it down and we'll move on to the light switch. Okay, friends, we have our new switch here. Now, on the, on the switch, all you have, you got two posts here on the side, okay? And what you do is you run, all you're doing is breaking the circuit. So from our outlet up here, we will hook the black wire to um, this post right here. And then uh, on the other wire that runs up through our top plate on the black wire, we'll make the connection here. And on the uh, white wire, we'll simply skin those back and twist them together and put a wire nut on them. And on the ground wire, We'll twist them two together also, leaving one side longer than the other. Equipment ground. And we will actually wrap it around the green screw here to make sure the switch is grounded too. So let's get started with that. Okay, we'll start with the ground wire. We got both our ground wires here. We've kind of worked them to the top of the box. One's cut about an inch and a half shorter. So let's go ahead and it's start too uh, short. twisting these together. Look how he's got to work in the box. And Don't we'll do that, folks. This is why I do these videos. Leave yourself enough conductor, okay, to make these connections, these splices. We'll these we'll See, he's just twisting them back in the box. How many people actually have come in boxes where you only got about this much, much of equipment ground, and it's twisted wire. all the way back in the back of the box, and you they can't even work on it? There. It's not what you want. That means a receptacle will only come out of the wall about that far, and that's not going to be conducive to working on things. Then we'll slide these little little uh, copper pieces on again. 
and crimp them down and that will ensure that we have a good ground connection and uh, we'll just go ahead and use our crimping tool here this is going to crimp at this time instead of mashing them down with the side cutters even though that is an automotive crimper <laughs> okay there's our ground wire now Remember, 300.14 says six inches of free conductor from the point it emerges from the cable. Got to have it. It also needs to extend out at least three inches past the front of this box. Let's go ahead and skin back our white wires and our black wires. On the white wires, we're going to skin back probably like an inch or so, okay? Way too much. an inch. And you're only going to make a curve. If you're doing it per the screw, you don't need an inch. Okay. And we're going to twist these two together. Okay. All right. He's making a that. splice. Let's go ahead and skin our black wires back. We'll go okay. Back. So he's splicing the whites because the black is the only thing that has to break we'll through the actual device. So we'll go about three quarters of an inch back. All right. He's doing these three quarter. Okay. Okay. Fine. Now. So here we go. With our white wires <clears throat> right here, just go ahead and grab them, line them up together, grab them out near the end, go ahead and twist them clockwise, and just kind of twist those together. And actually, if the whole wire, even with the insulation, starts twisting, that's okay. But we just want to get a good twist on it without overstressing the wire and causing it to break. Now at that point, go ahead and take yourself a uh, wire nut here. Okay. All right, a little advice here. So when you twist those together like that, again, at that point, trim off the ends to make them both make sure they're flush. Because typically when you're twisting them like that, that one might lead further than the other. The other thing to remember is that most of the wire nut manufacturers, and a wire nut is a trademark of ideal, by the way, but you have Gorilla Nuts and other type of ones, their instructions don't require you to actually pre-twist, okay? It's permitted to do that, but most of the time you just take the two conductors or whatever and you bring a strain in, you put a, a wire binding device on it and you're done. You don't have to pre-twist. Um, a lot of times if you have a bunch of conductors, pre-twisting can actually change the overall diameter of your assembly the, of all the conductors and it makes it hard for that wire binding device, a wire nut, to fit on there. Okay, so look at the manufacturers, believe it or not, many people ignore the fact that Manufacturers of wire nuts, uh, wire binding devices is a more appropriate name for them, um, have instructions and they will tell you whether or not you pre-twist them or don't. In some cases, they might say you don't pre-twist at all. Follow the instructions. In this case, really no harm, no foul. He's twisting them and then it's all to be, since there's only two of them, the wire binding device should be fine. Uh, but I will say, make sure you clean it off so that you know that, that you're not going to have any bear extending beyond the edge of the wire binding device. Okay, we don't want any bear showing outside of the actual wire nut. Okay, and we'll trim off just a little bit. I want to leave a There you go. I don't know. He heard me. An inch or so sticking out of here. So that was my point. Didn't and need then, to be an uh, inch if you're going to cut a half inch off. Because I want the wire to cover all that. I need down. wire. I need length of wire. So let's go ahead and take the wire nut and just force it on there. And the reason that I had you twist it in a clockwise motion is because that's the way this nut's going to go on here. And actually, hold on. I'm going to bite this off a little bit. Let's get another nut. It's not quite covered. I'm going to trim just a little bit more off of here. That's why I said you didn't need an inch. About another eighth of an inch off. But you learn those things. We just know this because that's what we do, but Screw you learn. That on there. Took him a little longer. He wasted a wire nut. That's about, yeah. I don't know, five that's cent, four cent. And from that point, you can take this and you can tuck it back into the box. You can tuck that back as far as you want to just to get it out of your way. And I'll leave your ground wire out here right now because we've got to make a connection. And we'll sure did it, did it, we'll probably wouldn't make that connection did it, did it. and then we'll put some J's on here and we'll hook up, hook the switch up. Let me just go ahead and show you. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Remember the switch? Uh, hang on. Here it is right here. It's in this position where you can read off 
and when it's flipped up, you read on. Okay. So think so about that. that. On right in the up position. It's very so common. If you see an on and off scenario, on and in the up. Three-way switches, doesn't matter. We're going to make this connection. Four-way, okay. doesn't matter. Single poles, on the in the up position. Upper wire that's going on up to our where our light's going to be one day. We'll put a J on there. We're going to make that connection, okay? Then we're going to make our ground wire right over here on the side, okay? So we're going to go ahead and do that and get ready to tuck it into the box. Okay friends, all the connections are made. Here's our ground wire here. And if I turn this around, you can see that where we've uh, hooked up the uh, black wire on each side. Yeah, it looks like he's got six inches on those circuit. blacks. At least extends three and, inches uh, past so the box. So, to, uh, tuck probably got six inches from the point where it emerges the, from the sheathing. Inside the box here. And like I said, this number 12 wire is a little stiff. So, I'm just gonna get all this tucked in here. Just remember, the six inches is a requirement. The three inches beyond the opening is in addition. The six inches might be enough to meet the three inches, okay? But you gotta have six inches from the point it emerges from the cable to the end, free conductor, or if it's a raceway from the point it emerges from the raceway, I need to have at least six inches of conductor, okay? The three inches that's required from the outside edge is just when any dimension is less than eight inches then I have to make sure it at least extends out. Now, why does that only apply for eight inches less? Because I could have a four gang box or even a five gang box. Then you would not have to have it extend three inches beyond it because it's greater than it's eight inches or greater. You just need the six inches. Okay. You have to have, that should still give you enough to work with. That's the whole concept there. All right. So just wanted to make it clear. Yeah, that looks pretty good there. We got a screw started there and one started there. So we'll go ahead and tighten down the switch. Friends, that's about all there is to it. Um, just remember, black wire is your hot wire. And it goes to the slotted side of the receptacle that's the smallest. The larger side, but the larger slot is your neutral wire. And uh, And remember, a switch is real simple. All you're doing is interrupting the, uh, the black wire, the hot wire. But you do need to ground your switch. You want all your switches. Every, every time you go into a box, whether it be hooking up a ceiling fan or something, there's going to be a place to run that ground wire. And you need to do that just for safety purposes. I hope that this video was helpful. And uh, just remember, I should remind you that his statement about grounding the switch is actually found in 404.9B that requires you to do it. Make sure you check that out. But that's why you have the uh, terminal on there. In this case, it's a non-metallic box. Since his equipment grounds in the box, he had to take it to actually take it to the actual strap. And that's where you had his separate green uh, equipment ground terminal point on that device. So. For switch grounding, 404.9B will give you all those allowances uh, for that. So again, true statement, no problem with that. Always practice good safety when messing around with electrical. And if you don't feel comfortable with it, just call a licensed electrician and let them uh, hook you up. And uh, friends, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed the video today and we will see you next time. Take care. All right. So again, uh, not that bad a video. Again, we're just getting into this electrical blooper series. Um, it's going to slowly start to get worse as we go. So again, we're building up to it right now. The last uh, two episodes that you've seen have not been that bad. Uh, on a scale, I'm going to give this gentleman an installation scale of about probably about five to five to maybe even six. Um, could have been a little bit better. So securing could be a little bit better. I don't like these leads. It's a violation of 300.14. Um, other than that, I believe also the back wiring probably violates the listing of that device, even though that was there existing. I did see some nail plates that need to be done. Um, and again, if he's going through top plates, again, everything is open right now, but at some point it will have to be sealed. So it's better to seal it while you're there. Maintain the rating of that assembly, 300.21. It's all open right now. So it probably doesn't matter. Um, but 
Again, things to think about as you move forward, securing his cables. Again, since it's nail up single gang boxes uh, that are four by two and a quarter, then he's gonna make sure that he secures that cable within eight inches of the box. Um, and if it's a two gang box with connectors built into it, uh, whether it's non-metallic or metal, then you could go up to 12 inches, but then you have to, you have to put a staple or securing mechanism every four and a half feet. Now, when it goes above a ceiling over the rafters or through the, the over top of, uh, ceiling members, uh, framing members like the ceiling joists, or if there's another room up there, floor joists, but when it goes into an attic, let's say like in his case, then you have to remember that you are running it up there. You still have to secure it and support it every four and a half feet. Just because it's laying on top of the framing members does not mean it's secured. So you still have to meet the requirements of 334.30, regardless of whether it's in the wall, whether it's above a ceiling. And if you're running horizontal through board holes, then it's considered secure and support as long as that framing members aren't more than four and a half feet. And they're usually not going to be. They're usually be 16 or 18 inches on center. So you should be okay there. But when you're running vertically, you still have to meet the securing supporting rules. And even though it goes through a framing member, let's say a brace, it's still not going to qualify. You still have to have a securing mechanism, staple, strap, or what have you within eight inches of those single gang boxes or 12 inches of a box with a built-in clamp, like a two gang, three gang, four gang, or what have you. Okay, so a lot of information to give you. Hopefully you got something out of the video. Uh, great job to the gentleman. Again, a DIYer, did the best he could. Some things I would do differently, and I made those points during the video. Hopefully that'll help you when you get into your installation just to make it just a little bit easier. Till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless.